What's going on, everybody? Thanks for tuning in to Wrestling Changed My Life podcast. Today's guest is Jim Hershaw. Jim was an All-American at the University of Virginia and now is a performance coach and is really well known for his TED Talk on why I teach my kids to fail. And that's kind of the whole thesis of his, uh, of his program, if you will. For more information on Jim, go to jimhershawjr.com. And without further ado, sit back and enjoy this one. Peace. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time. Enjoy the show. Well, I was a fanatic. There's no doubt a fanatic. My goal was to get carried out of the wrestling room because of exhaustion, and it never happened. The thing it did for me every day about 6 o'clock is that when I got out, I looked back in, and there was nobody else there. Bottom line was I didn't reach my goal. So guess what happened? I went back in the room again. But I got some quality time because of just some kind of a fanatic goal. All right, Jim, welcome to the podcast. Great to be here, Ryan. Thanks for having me. No, thank you. This is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, I know we were talking before the call and it sounds like we have some, some commonalities in our background. So excited to dig into that. But before we do, you might be the only wrestling uh, all American that has their own Ted talk. So and the theme is, you know, success through failure. And we're going to dive into that stuff, but how did this all start? And maybe just walk us through your journey through wrestling, you know, your freshman, sophomore, junior years and kind of the breakthrough you had your senior year. Yeah, absolutely. So there's one, uh, there's at least one other wrestler that I know who is an all American who has a TEDx talk and that's Coit Cooper. So I recommend him as a podcast guest this guys. Awesome. Um, he was an all American for Indiana and, uh, just a, a great dude. So, um, <laughs> but as far as, excuse, <laughs> excuse me, <laughs> excuse me, mom, as far as my story. So I grew up about a half an hour North of Pittsburgh. I'm a country boy, grew up on 10 acres and used to, you know, be able to grab my gun and run out the back door and, and go hunting. And, uh, we split wood year round and just blue collars it gets, you know, and, uh, you know, parents didn't go to college, but they gave me every opportunity in the world. They just traveled me all around to, to compete and to train. And, uh, you know, luckily I was in a great place, like where I got to compete with guys like Teak Moore, who's the head wrestling coach at American university. He was just, you know, one of my closest friends growing up and, uh, our, you know, teammates since a little kid and, and, uh, you know, on the, on the national teams, et cetera. And, um, so that's kind of, that was kind of my start in the sport and, um, you know, got through high school and I really wanted to be a Pennsylvania state champion. And that was my goal. And, uh, you know, senior year, finally get to the state championships. My second trip there, didn't get on the podium my first year there, my junior year, uh, senior year, I'm going to win it. Right. And, um, uh, ended in utter, utter failure once again, and didn't even get on the podium, uh, my senior year in high school. And that was just devastating. So I ended up going to college, got recruited by, University of Virginia and a few other schools, not really schools who saw me, um, but saw my results because my results weren't great. But uh, but uh, a couple of coaches who saw how hard I trained, who, you know, these guys were both the assistant coaches, uh, the national team, Pennsylvania national team. They saw how hard I trained and how hard I worked. And um, it was University of Pennsylvania, Roger Reina and uh, University of Virginia, Jim Akerley. Um, Roger's the head coach there at Penn again now. And, and Jim Akerley runs the Quest School of Wrestling south of Pittsburgh. Anyway, got to Penn, got to UVA. Um, didn't even know if I belonged on a Division One team, to be honest. And uh, my, my roommate was a Pennsylvania State champion, Matt Roth. Um, and uh, my first year, I freshman year, I redshirted. And then uh, the next four years, I ended up making the starting lineup. And um, freshman year, qualified for the national championships. Failed. Um, sophomore year, John McGovern shows up. And who John McGovern's head wrestling coach at Dubuque University now, who you and I are a you know, mutual friend there. And mm-hmm. um, uh John planted into my head that somehow that I can be, I can be really good, you know, and got me believing it and um, really just changed my work ethic and level of thinking and, um, and uh, got the national championships again, my sophomore year failed, got to the national championships again, my junior year failed to become an all American. You know, I always had that goal of being an all American every time I got there. And, and then, um, you know, got to the end of my junior year and I worked as hard as a person can possibly work. I mean, I, I, I wrestled freestyle and Greco all summer long. I went to the Olympic Training Center. I went to University Nationals, wrestled both styles. I did everything. I traveled around, hit every wrestling camp I could get hired at as a counselor just so I could train. 
um, I lived it, right? I lived it. And still I failed and I failed and I failed and I failed over and over. And by the time my junior year ended, I'm walking out of the national championships, just, you know, my face buried in a towel in tears thinking like, what, what, what's wrong with me? You know, why I, I work as hard or harder than these other guys who I see getting on the podium and doing great things. Like what's wrong with me? You know, am I just, am I not good enough? Am I not smart enough? Am I not capable enough? And, um, I went through that whole off season with one mission, figuring out what the heck is wrong with me and, and how do I do this? How do I break through? You know, what's the, what's the missing ingredient? And, and I searched and I searched and I searched and I talked to every Olympian and national champion and head coach that I could talk to all summer long, you know, as I was driving around training and the Olympic training center and everything else. And, uh, and I, and I, you know, get to my senior year and, and I had, well, hold on a second. what'd you, what'd answer. you find that summer when you're, uh, did you find any commonalities or anything that maybe jumped out to you? Nothing. Really? Nothing. Okay. I, I had no answer. So I go into my senior year with nothing going like, and it was literally the night before the first tournament. Um, and it wasn't even on the schedule. I just decided I'm going to wrestle as many matches as I can possibly wrestle my senior year and, and whatever happens, happens. So it's the night before, uh, the West Virginia Open, I'd driven out there, and um, and I said to myself the night before, I said, listen, you, you, you sought for the answer all summer long, and, and you never found it. And you talked to some great people, and, and you still never found the answer. And I said, so all you can do now, Jim, is just go for it. You can wrestle. You can wrestle as hard as you can. And, and that's the outcome is the outcome. You control the process. Let go of the outcome, Jim. Just let go of it. If you're an All-American, you're a national champion, that's great. If, if you fail once again, that's fine too. All you can do is try your hardest, have fun, and, and then just you can sleep at night knowing you did your best. And that was the, that, that's what I carried in with me the next morning to weigh-ins and onto the mat for that first match. And I had so much fun in that first match. And I won. And then I had so much fun in that second match. And I won again. Uh, I ended up going 5-0 and that day, won the championship. and and I would say, wait a second, like, this is really fun to wrestle like this, right? With no weight on your shoulders, no, no pressure, and to just let go and, and just, just flow. You know, I've been competing for 17 years. I competed overseas and competed against the best in the country and the best in the world. And I said, just wrestle, man. Just go and just have fun and, and control, the, control the process. You can't control the outcome. I decided I cannot. I don't have influence over the outcome. I have influence over the process of how I sleep how I eat, how I train, how I warm up, how I stretch out, what film I watch, all these things. And, you know, I can control those and then the outcome is what it is. And so I decided to focus on the process and I had the best year of wrestling in my life. I had the most fun I've ever had in my life wrestling that year. And, uh, and I, I finally became an All-American and achieved a meaningful goal. And it was, uh, I had the most fun doing it. And so you were just absolutely obsessed all throughout college doing everything you could and it, it's not like you're a guy where from what I can tell you were like struggling to find motivation you were motivated you just couldn't find the oh, result yeah. you were looking for yeah you're right and so, so how personal was that that moment in that hotel room that night when you're kind of by yourself at some you know maybe it's not super well known so I'm just open tournament you know beginning of the year that had to be a pretty uh, pretty intense moment with yourself yeah you know what it was um it probably sounds like this most of this intense moment. I didn't realize it at the time. At the time, it was just like almost like a, a moment of um, I give up. It was a moment of, um, you know, there, there's, there's nothing you can really do here, Jim. You, you sought for the answer and, and you failed once again at finding, you know, the answer and the solution. So um, just, it, it was kind of let, I let go and I gave up on the outcome, right? And, and it sounds like a bad thing. Um, but it turned out to be this just ultimate blessing for me. And it's this blessing in disguise that I've discovered over and over and over. When you talk to high performers, they don't talk about, they don't talk about competing to necessarily win or lose. They compete to be their absolute best and maximize, maximize every ounce of everything that they've got. And that's, that's what you control. And literally you can't control the referee. You can't control who, who you wrestle. You can't control the matchup. You know, if, if you've got to step on the mat against, you know, Jordan Burroughs and, and you're like a high school wrestler with two years of experience, your goal is not necessarily to beat Jordan Burroughs. It's also right. not, you're also not conceding victory either. It, that's, all, that's irrelevant. What's relevant is 
I'm going to compete to my maximum capacity. That's what I'm going to do. When we go out of bounds, I'm going to run to the center. I'm going to beat them to the line every time. Um, if I get taken down, I'm going to have the mindset of, you know, in folks, I'm going to have the mindset of I'm, get, I'm exploding off bottom and get my escape. If I get the right. takedown, my mindset is I'm going for the turn, right? That's, that's what you control in life. That's life, right? That's not, that's not wrestling. That's, that is the world. And, you know, I've got a wife and four kids and uh, a great business. And, you know, I, I've, I've made that switch and that sh shift in my business as well. It's like, because I do motivational speaking and, 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 right. um, and, and, and personal performance coaching. And when I talk to prospects, I'm not trying to sell them. I'm not trying to win the sale. I'm trying to serve these people and give them everything I've got. And, and when I do that, I end up getting the result I want. When I stop doing that, when I try to go for the sale, it's, it, I, fa I fail, right? I don't do as well. And it's not as fun. But what's really fun is serving people and caring and giving my best. No, absolutely. And we're, I do want to get into how you went from being an All-American to, to doing a TED Talk and, and, and kind of what you're doing now. But one thing that's kind of coming through to me is, is this theme of indifference, which is something I picked up in about two months ago. And it's really interesting because this guy, I can't think of his name right now. He was just on Joe Rogan, but he talks about happiness is coming from having indifference over things you can't control. Like, all right, if it happens, yeah. it happens. But you know, you can't, you're not going to be able to ever control a result. And, you know, I'm in sales, same thing there. You can't control if someone says yes or no, you just can't. Um, but so you almost had indifference, indifference over the result. And kind of, as you said, it sounds like a really weak attitude to have, but really that's, that's the opposite. It, it kind of empowers you to, to free yourself and do your best. Um, now take us to the national tournament because you have a, I read somewhere that you were wrestling a guy who was ranked fifth, fourth or fifth in the country and you'd never beat someone in the top five. And this is the match to, to all American take us there. Then we want to, then I'll jump to kind of what you're doing now. I'd love to just understand uh, that moment though. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I step on the mat with Josh holiday, who I respect the heck out of this guy. He's just such a great wrestler. And, um, he's ranked fourth in the country he's from, from Minnesota. They're the number one ranked team in the country. Uh, I'm on the University of Virginia. We're not even on the radar in terms of, you know, team rankings and um, at the time. And, uh, and it's the match of my life, right? It's, got, it's like my whole life, 17 years of my wrestling career, blood, sweat, tears, money, energy, time, every, just sacrifice, all this. It comes down to seven minutes, right? If I win, I'm an All-American. If I lose... I'm just a guy who kind of had a, a decent career and, 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 you know, did some things and never really kind of broke through. And, um, and to be honest, you know, now I got to look back and you got to say like, you know, I, you know, if I didn't get the last takedown, am I, am I a different person? Like, no, I'm not. Right. But, but at that, in that moment, like there's this immense amount of pressure, but I had to consciously choose indifference. Right. And I had to choose performance over winning. And mm -hmm. And it was a, it was a, it was a hard thing to do. It required a lot of sort of mental focus uh, and the ability to let go. And, and I was able to do that. And so I step on the mat and, and here's one thing, Brendan Buckley, who I know you had Brendan Buckley yeah. on the, uh, on the podcast here recently. So Buckley was my assistant coach at the time. Lenny Bernstein was the head coach. And I told Buckley, I said, Hey man, before I step on the mat, you need to tell me a joke. <laughs> like as I'm <laughs> buckling my strapping on my headgear, I, you need to have a joke ready because I need to smile before I step on the mat because I don't want to take this too seriously. I don't want to start, start thinking about the outcome. I need, you need you to break the ice. So he did. He had a joke ready. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I step on the mat, I step on the mat and, um, and, and it's go time. We shake hands and I blast through on a shot and I take, take him down and we go out of bounds. It's a clear takedown. And, uh, and they, they say no takedown. It's like, okay, it doesn't matter. I don't get rattled. It's not a, it's not a thing. Cause me, it's, it's it. I'm indifferent, right? It doesn't matter if the referee right. calls a takedown or not. The only choice I have is to compete. And so we step on the line again, I get the takedown and, and, uh, ends up being a, a real heck of a battle. And I win 10, eight and, um, and, and I got it. Right. And, um, and it was, it was, uh, it was just, uh, you know, a great moment that I'll never forget. 
it's a great story and it kind of set the theme for this this career you have in personal coaching and uh, I, I don't know if you call it personal development but the whole theme of your of your program is um, you know success through failure and one of the things that I'd love to get your take on is how do we start to remove the stigma that failure is the same as losing because losing is a very nasty word failure though to me is an indicator of this is what you need to work on to get better. So how did we remove that stigma? You know, conversation, right? And, and, and even failure, that, that word just has like, you know, people think of that as like utter failure, complete devastation, loss, you know, no recovery. But, you know, even, even that word, whether it's lose or failure or whatever the word you want to use, it's just we have a connotation of it, right? Um, and you have to make a conscious choice to go, okay, I lost, I failed, whatever word you want to use and say, I'm actually better off for it. I'm, I'm literally better. It's, it's hard, emotional in the moment, especially with a sport like wrestling. You can't walk off the mat and go, man, that was great. I just lost. <laughs> um, <laughs> but if you, can, if you can have the presence of mind and you hear the champion say it, if you, you, if you have the presence of mind to, to recover and say, okay, that, that failure has taught me something and I, I am better off now for it. If you can choose to say those words, then that changes everything, right? If you choose to say different words, um, then your mindset goes the other direction. I'm not good enough. I'm not capable enough. Uh, I'm always going to fail. I'm a failure. Uh, or, you know, the, the alternative. Yeah, it's all about self-reflection and then the story we tell ourselves afterwards. Really, you know, two people could have the exact same event, but the story they tell themselves could be drastically different, and that, that ultimately impacts what they do next. Um, you know, that's something you, you yeah. certainly harp on a lot in your, in your um, presentation. So how did you get to get to you know, the point you're at now? Because there's, you know, every year there's, what, call it 60, 80 All-Americans, eight at each way. And I, I've heard you say it's actually statistically harder to be All-American in wrestling than be drafted by the NFL, which I didn't, which I didn't know that. But, you know, so you All-American, and then you kind of go on this epic journey through Mexico, which I want to talk about. But how do you get to yeah. there? From where you're at, from where you're there to where you're at now. Um, so from all American to where I'm at now, man, it's uh, yeah, it's like doing um, TED talks and like personal coaching. I mean, yeah. that's freaking awesome. How'd you do that? Yeah, well, it's you know, it's it's one foot in front of another, and so I got right into uh, right after I graduated, I went to I did that. I took a year off, just traveled like crazy, and did, went on some ridiculous adventures, uh, which I've been starting to talk a little bit about on my podcast, um, <laughs> and then got into coaching. I was a, you know, assistant at UVA, I became the youngest division one head wrestling coach in the country at Slippery Rock University. Um, coached for about a decade collegiately and then started and then chose to get out of the sport, out of coaching um, just because of the balance factor. I didn't do a good job of balancing things and started my first business. That was a success. I sold that. Started my second business, raised some venture capital, angel capital, uh, built the software and, um, and that actually took me to a, a point of failure. Uh, uh, that business, um, you know, I've kind of put my head down, gr nose the grindstone, athlete's mindset, single-minded focus. And um, unfortunately, single-minded focus does not work in the real world. Uh, some of these lessons that we learn as an athlete, is, certainly as a wrestler, as a competitor like that, um, they're good, there's value, but you've got to apply them in the right way. And I was applying it in the wrong way. And so I put my head down building this business. And two years later, I lifted my head up going, wait a second, like, I'm trying to build this great business for my family and for to have this great life. And I said, I'm running, I'm, I'm going the, I'm building the, I'm doing everything the opposite, right? I actually had a, I had a failed marriage, uh, a failing marriage. I had a, you know, a failed relationship with my kids. I had two, two kids at the time. I've got four now. Um, I wasn't spending enough time with my kids. I was in the worst physical shape of my life. As a guy who identifies as an athlete, uh, I was in terrible shape. Um, I had a, you know, I was broke uh, financially. I had debt up to our eyeballs. I had a failed business. Um, I was in a pretty dark spot. And wow, from there, I kind of realized, I, I kind of had this moment of like, you know, I, I'm, you know, I was looking through Craigslist for a job as I was closing down my business and thinking to myself, like, how did I end up here? Right. Uh, I, I had two degrees from the number one public school in the country, University of Virginia. I, had, I was an All-American. Uh, I was the youngest Division One head coach in the country. Started my first business, sold that. That was a success. Everything was like success, right? Success after success after success. 
I, you know, I was invited to live and train at the Olympic Training Center. I was a Greco guy, and um, I was mm-hmm. invited to, to be a resident athlete out there, and I just I turned that down. But I had all this opportunity and success, and now here I am in, in complete failure. I said, how, how did I turn that around when I was an athlete? Like, when I was competing, what did I have in place in my life that allowed me to succeed despite failure or maybe even because of failure? And I realized there's certain things in my life that, that allowed me to, to, to live a balanced life, to live an aligned life, uh, and to live a fulfilling life. And I had none of those in my life at that moment. And, and that is, uh, that's the basis. Those, these four sort of core things, these core pieces were, are, are now the, the, they're the foundation for my training and coaching program. And, um, I teach them to amazing people from, uh, so I'll give it to you in the simplest form. It's obviously much deeper than this, but um, the yeah. simplest form is number one, you understand what you value, right? I knew very clearly that when I was competing that I valued uh, toughness. I valued, valued discipline. Uh, I valued uh, being respected, like just like all the people who I looked up mm-hmm. to, right? Uh, not only the guys who I had posters on my wall, but the, the coaches who I had, the John McGoverns of the world, Lenny Bernstein's and Charlie Branch. I don't even want to start naming them because there's too many to name and I'll miss them. Right. Miss right, way too right. many, <laughs> but um, Brendan Buckley, you know, um, but, but I wanted to be like these guys. I wanted to, you know, I respected them and, and, um, uh, and so that was what I valued. And number two is my, my goals were in direct alignment with what I valued, right? Not in alignment with what I see on Facebook. They weren't, my goals weren't aligned with what's parked in my neighbor's driveway. My goals were not aligned with what I see on in, in the media. My goals were aligned with what is important to Jim Harshaw. And, and because of that, I was able to achieve something significant and I was able to go through pain and suffering. I was able to lose 22 pounds in two and a half days. Um, because what? <laughs> my goals, yeah, oh. because my goals were in alignment with, with what I valued, right? I was able to do hard things like we wrestlers can do. And, you get out into the real world and you're pulling a million different directions, right? You don't have that clarity that you have when you're competing. You don't have that clarity of action. um, And that peace of mind that you get from those hyper-focused goals. And so anyway, number one, core values, number two, aligned goals. And I said before that single-minded focus doesn't work in the real world. It doesn't Uh, unless, unless you don't have a family, you don't have friends, you don't have anything else in your life. Um, but you've got to have goals in not just your professional goals, your financial goals, your career goals, but also in your relationships. You got to have personal growth goals. You got to have health and wellness goals. All these things are connected, right? Um, that's not all those things aren't so important when you're when you're competing and you're an athlete. Um, but when you get out into the real world, you have you know spouse, kids, job. You got to maintain multiple areas of your life. So um, anyway, that's what I work with people on. Those are the first two steps. The third step yep. is I had an environment of excellence when I was competing. We all did. You know, we had coaches who kicked us in the ass if we needed a kick or lifted us up whenever we needed lifted up. Um, we had teammates. I held them accountable. They held me accountable. Um, it's not just people, but it's like self-talk, right? It's, it's talk. It's the language that you use, right? Um, you know, I had mantras, right, when I was competing. That I, things that I said to myself before I stepped on the mat. Um, I had... Uh, 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 media in my life that I didn't watch much TV when I was competing. What I did, I, when I did, I watched the national championships. I watched the world championships. I broke down film of my opponents. I broke down film of myself. Uh, I had an audio that I would listen to this positive mindset audio, right? So it's this whole environment that you create or you have around you when you're performing at a high level. I didn't have that. I didn't have that in my life. Um, and then fourth and finally is, you know, steps one through three sound nice. But when, if you don't have step four, it's like, it's worthless. You know, everybody wants to set goals and, and have their core values and create this environment. But if if you don't actually have a plan to follow through when the rubber meets the road, like when you show up at work on Monday and something blows up, uh, uh, or, or you come home and, 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 and your, your relationships are a struggle at home or your kids are sick and, and everything gets, starts going sideways in life. If you don't have a plan to follow through, all that work was just kind of a nice, nice little piece of work you did, and, but it's a waste of time. They all collect, you put them on a shelf and they collect us, right? Because we're pulling a million different directions. Um, we just know we right. need to be consistent. We need to be focused. And that's what this plan does for me. 
Um, and I realized after 200 and some podcast episodes and interviews with high performers that this is not something that Jim discovered. Uh, uh, this is, or created, this is something I discovered uh, or, or rediscovered because it, it was in my life when I was competing at a high level. Um, and it's part of uh, every high performer's life who I've, I've interviewed. Now, it's, it's definitely true that common themes come, tr- uh, come through these conversations that you have with people uh, who theoretically have success in life. Um, I want to go back just one second to that moment because it, it seems like in your life, maybe rock bottom, I guess, and, and maybe I wasn't, but, um, you know, so it was a result of what, having a single-minded focus on your business and kind of letting other areas of your life kind of fall apart uh, to the exclusion of that business. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So how did you, so outside of the weight gain, like what were some steps you took to kind of rebuild the relationship with your family? Um, that's a great, great question. In terms of rebuilding my life with my family, it was like putting them in the right place in my life. Right. It's like, like, wait a second. My wife is actually the most important human being in my life. Right. And you know, not my kids. And, and that's a biblical thing, to be honest. Um, you know, your spouse is number one and, and, and I had to put my, my wife number one and you know, over everything else, over my business, over everything else. And, and I wasn't doing that. And so once I did that, that's kind of that, well, that is, that's not kind of, it is the number one goal. It's the first goal that I work on with people because I don't care how much money you have. I don't care how fit you are. If you don't have your relationships in place, you're not going to be happy. Right? So that's number one. We work on that. Everybody kind of what goes straight to like health goals or money goals. And those are important, really important. Um, but they're all important. So we start with that. So started putting my wife in the right place in my life. Started, you know, started talking about doing date nights. I actually took it over. I said, we're having date nights. And, and I, I scheduled them, right? I scheduled time with my wife. I scheduled time with my kids. Started making these conscious decisions. Uh, it wasn't a flip of a switch and I did it overnight. It was this evolution. Um, and I've been doing this for, I don't know, seven years or eight years now, something like that. And I, I've constantly learned. And now that I'm teaching people too, I've been teaching people for about four years. Um, I've learned, right? I learn every day from these coaching sessions that I have with, with these amazing people I coach. And um, yeah. I constantly honed that system down to specific tactics and, and tools and tricks and that sort of thing. And that's all part of your plan. And people can, <clears throat> and can contact you if they want to learn more. Just by going to your website, essentially? Yeah, absolutely. Just go to my website or you can just go to jimharshawjr.com slash apply if you want to jump on a call. I just do free calls. Um, but yeah, I'm not here to promote any of that. But yeah, if people do want to have that conversation, just, just go to my website and, and, and we, can, we can jump on a call. Yeah, no, I think it's important though because it's very it's a counterintuitive to to a lot of goal setting things I've listened to. I I followed some that Tony Robbins has put out and, and others, but you know what caught my attention about your stuff is that you put the relationships of your family and friends front and center. And you know, I was actually just walking around the other day, like last week, and I was thinking back to when I was competing and relationships with my friends was like tenth on the list, if if at all even on the list. I didn't even care about it. I was you know, so single minded focus, but now I love the relationships with my friends and my, you know, my family and my, and my girlfriend and all of it. And so it's just in, interesting how it changes in life. Yeah. I guess how important that is to you. And I, the reality though, Jim is that I almost felt guilty that I had my friends and my family up so high on the list, but then I saw your stuff and it's like, all right, this guy's got his stuff together. He thinks it's important. Obviously it's important, you know, for a balanced life. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, so, how, and then how did you go from that to, you know, starting kind of a personal coaching business and getting on a, uh, on the stage at, at TEDx? How did that all happen? Um, failure <laughs> is, is, is the one word <laughs> answer, but, um, so honestly, I, uh, uh, I, I, I had to speak in public once and literally I was just kind of asking a question, uh, to a panelist in front of a big audience. And I got really nervous to the point where like anybody who listened to me stand up and ask that question with a microphone in my hand could tell like, Oh my gosh, this guy was really nervous. Why was he so nervous asking a question? Right. Um, yeah. And it was like, man, this is not, this is not okay. If I want to, you know, if I have goals in life, you know, it's, you know, just, you know, speaking and communicating, that's just a, a high value skill. So I said, I got to fix this. So I, signed up for Toastmasters and began just practicing my public speaking. Uh, I was driving to work one day. Uh, you know, I've, I heard this great 
quote once. It says, uh, you can't stumble into something unless you're moving forward. And so I stumbled into something. As a matter of fact, I have a podcast episode coming up called, uh, uh, it's about the yeah, but syndrome, right? And, and I could say, yeah, but I got this TEDx talk because I, I stumbled into something and I really did. Um, but I was moving forward too. Um, and so anyway, I, I was driving to the office one day and, and I heard, you know, Charlottesville TEDx. I had all their great lineups of speakers from around the world. It's one of the top, it's uh, in the top 1% of the largest TED events in the world is right here in Charlottesville. And we have one community spot. They said, uh, you have to get your application in today. Uh, we're taking one community member, one community speaker to speak at our, at our the event this year. So, wow, that sounds cool. But I've got 12 hours of work to do in an eight hour day today. Unfortunately, I won't even be able to have a chance to send in an application. And but it was due at five o'clock, the application about four o'clock. I said, you know what? I'm freaking doing this. This is something you just got to do it, Jim. So I ran up to my car, baby. held up my phone in front of me and I held up my phone up in front of me. I, I recorded a quick two minute sort of video, demo video, sent it in, got an email a week later. It says, Hey, 65 people applied 25 of you. We are choosing to do an open mic night and we're going to let the audience choose who makes it. So this is kind of like a preliminary event to the main event. And so 25 of us got four minutes in front of an audience of about 500 people who showed up downtown Charlottesville and I won, <laughs> I won. <laughs> and, um, uh, and I, you know, there's more of the story, but you know, it's not like I just don't, I, I worked, I called the guy who won this the prior year. I said, Hey man, give me some tips and tactics. I was reading, I was studying, I was reading books, I was learning, you know, it was always more to meet the eye, you know? And, Anyway, so I won, which means a, a month later, I'm on the main stage for the, uh, for the main Charlottesville TED event, and um, they assign you a speaking coach. I had a great speaking coach, and, and I, got, uh, I got to speak at the main, main event there in Charlottesville. And that's, so that's how that came about. Um, and let me tell you another quick story of failure. Yeah. Um, so I had about a month to prepare, and during that month, I actually got invited to speak in front of another audience of about, I don't know, 100 people, 150 people. No, about 100 people. And and uh, just for free, you know, and, and I was like, okay, I'm going to practice. It's a great opportunity for me to practice my TED Talk because it was a week before the main TED event. TED event. I'm like, I got to have this thing pretty honed and dialed in by now, so let me just practice it on this group. This is a great opportunity. I went up there and had a total brain fart, uh, almost had a nervous breakdown in front of about 85 or 100 people and trying to practice no my way. talk. Yeah. And uh, what total, happened? total failure. I just, I lost my place and I was trying to memorize all this. And, um, and I was trying to tie it. It was like my Ted talk is only seven minutes and I was slated to talk for 20 minutes. So I didn't really plan on how to, how to make it all work together. And, um, and it was terrible. It was a horrible, horrible feeling, especially it's like preparing for, It'd be like like Jordan Burroughs preparing for the world championships and like uh, uh, like he goes to a tournament a month earlier and he loses to like some like high school kid like some scrub yeah. you know <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and 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 like where does that put you mentally for the biggest match of your life and biggest speaking event of my life um, and not in a very good place but but I had to recover from that and a week later I delivered the talk of my life and it's been this this great TEDx talk but. But I tell you, failure is a necessary step on that path. You know, for anybody listening, and you're, you're saying you have these goals, these hopes, these dreams, these wishes, these wants, and you're saying to yourself, yeah, but I failed. Yeah, but I'm not good at that. Yeah, but I'm embarrassed to try. Yeah, but, yeah, but you can yeah about yourself to death and to your grave. Um, step up, man. Step into your fear. That's the only way to move forward in your life. And that's, that's how I've been able to do it. Now, what have you learned and what do you coach folks on in terms of regaining confidence after a failure so that the self-doubt doesn't creep in so much to kind of inhibit you, so to speak? Yeah, so tactically, I, there's some tactics, but really I'll talk at the strategic level before we get down to tactics. But strategically, you have to have the system in place, right? The core values, mm -hmm. the goals, the environment of excellence, and the plan for follow-through. Because if you have those in place, failure is almost irrelevant right? It's like, well, that's just kind of a step on the path, on the path. That's part of the goal. It's like failure doesn't change your values, what you, what's important to you. Failure doesn't change your goals. Um, and when you fail and you have an environment of excellence, then you have, you're saying the right self-talk, 
uh, you have the right people, mentors, coaches, you know, people in your environment and your, your plan for follow through doesn't change. Right. So, um, self doubt's part of it. I don't care who it is. Self doubt is there. <clears throat> you got to have <clears throat> ways to defeat it, ways to combat it. Um, and the system is, is, is a big part of that strategically. Um, but tactically it's like, you know, writing down your goals. It's, it's remembering your wins, <clears throat> remembering all the reasons why you, you should believe in yourself. Right. I mean, I keep going back to Jordan Burroughs. He's just this, you know, he's obvious. He's the obvious answer for us all right now. Um, shoot yeah. Kyle Snyder. He got foot swept and yeah. pinned in the yeah. national championships. He's an Olympic gold medalist. Right. Yep. Did he dwell on, you know, I'm, I'm not even good enough to win a national championship in America against college guys. Uh, how do you have the guts to actually believe you can win at the highest level on the planet? Well, he did not long after that. <laughs> so. And it's, it's, it all just goes back to having a system in place, which is part of the process. And if you kind of remove the outcome from it, you know, the next, let's say you win the national title the next day, guys like Dan Gable, you read about him. He's still going for a run the next morning after the Munich Olympics. Cause that's part of his plan. Yeah. process. The outcome doesn't that's part impact. of the process. Right. Exactly. Okay. Um, this is great stuff. Now I know we're getting ready to wrap up just a couple of quick questions for me before you. Um, the first one is what were some things you took away from the professional speaking coach? If you can remember anything um, specifically. Yeah. So there's nothing specific, but this is what I took away. I took away that you can't do this on your own. Mm. I, I should know that I should have known that. Right. I was a wrestler. You were a wrestler. Everybody listening, most of them were wrestlers. Most of you guys I'm talking to you were wrestlers. Like, you can't do it on your own. Like, Jordan Burroughs doesn't do it. He's, he's the best wrestler on the planet. Kyle Snyder, best wrestlers on the planet. Like, they don't do it on their own. They go, you know, I had a coach. Like, I'm good now. Like, I got my degree. got my education. You know, I won some national championships. Like, I'm, I'm good. I don't need – I'm just going to train. I'm just going to go over here and work out with my partner. Like, oh, like, they have yeah. coaches, right? And so that was what, what I took away from that experience is like, you know, this woman, she's not even like, uh, she's like a professional coach, but that's not her thing, her main job. Right. But she was able to help me have them to talk in my life. I mean, she honed this thing with me and she was so awesome. And I'm so thankful that I learned like, okay, Jim, coaching is not just for athletes. It's like, you want to be great at something? Shoot. You just want to get, be better at something, whether it's your relationship or being more consistent or having clear goals, or, you know, if you feel like you're leaving too much on the table in your life, you know, there's more potential in you step outside, do what, do what the highest performers in the planet do. Right. Bill Gates said everybody Every, should have a coach. Eric, Eric, everyone Schmidt, has a the, coach. Yeah. Yeah. You start talking have to you these high really performers. Like, yet? I've not, but I've heard, I uh, heard an interview on it recently. With Eric Schmidt on Tim Ferriss, yeah, it's so freaking good. Yep, I'm reading it now. My right. my one of my best friends, Tom Alema, who hosts his own podcast called Millennial Momentum, he sent it to me, and man, it is fascinating because the guys in this book, it's like Steve Jobs, Jeff Bezos, and Eric Schmidt, you know, three of probably the wealthiest and most influential people in the world, all had the same coach, and it just kind of goes to that that same yeah. theme of what well, you're talking about about the speaking coach. You can't do it alone. Um, yeah. So like the last point on this is like, yeah. if Jeff Bezos yeah. needs a coach, like, don't you, right? I mean, I have a coach. I pay money out of my pocket to help make me the best version of myself. I have multiple coaches right. actually. And, right. and it's just, I just want to plant that seed for people. And this doesn't, I'm not talking about me, you know, get, get a coach, get somebody outside anyway, of you to help yeah. you. Right. Right. Now, how do, and the second last question for you is how do you organize your day and your week and like what's your routine what time do you get up all that stuff <laughs> yeah so i get up at 5 30 every day um i like to get up a little earlier but i can never get to bed on time i got four kids so getting them to bed is always uh, uh in time right. for me to get you know, <laughs> good seven hours of sleep is always a challenge but anyway uh so i get up at 5 30 every day uh typically work out most more actually i don't even work out right away anymore i used to kind of switch my routine here about six or eight months ago um i get up drink a big 16 ounce glass of water and get right into my work. Uh, a lot of times I'll either do a quick five minute journal, uh, meditation, and uh, then I'll just work for about an hour and then I'll, uh, then I'll work out. 
and then I'll, uh, then I'll, you know, kids are waking up by then and kind of getting ready for, for life with, uh, four kids and, and uh, kind of get myself ready and get myself out the door. That's my morning routine. But I, I should say this also, I get all starts the night before a good, a good, good morning routine starts the night before. Actually, matter of fact, just before we talked here, I had a coaching call with one of my clients and, uh, we were talking about, you know, you know, the, one of the core habits for him, keystone habits was getting to bed, is getting to bed on time. Cause if you get to bed a half an hour late, cause you're scrolling through social media, you, you know, you either lose a half an hour of sleep or you wake up 30 minutes later and now your days, you know, you're, you're behind, right? You don't have time to meditate or pray or, uh, work out or do the things you know, you need to do to get your day started off on the right foot. So anyway, that's, that's kind of my morning routine. I'll kind of give you this piece of advice. If I could hone all of my 200 and some podcast episodes down to one piece of advice. And if there is a, such a thing as the secret to success, it's, you know, people talk about, you know, hard work and you know, whatever, get a coach, all these different things. Like it's none of those. It's this, you know, every, every time I ask people about their habits that have made them successful, it's always some version of pause. So for the New York times bestselling author, their secret to success isn't, 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 it's not about like their secret, their habit. It's not about writing for the investor, billionaire investor. It's not about investing for the super successful salesperson. It's not about making the sales call. It's always some version of pause and that's journaling. It's prayer. It's meditation. It's coaching. It's being in a mastermind group. It's always some version of getting off the treadmill of life. And I've given this a term and, and a definition. I call it a productive pause. And the definition is a productive pause is a short period of focused reflection around specific questions that leads to clarity of action and peace of mind. And that's what we all want. We all want clarity of action. We all want peace of mind. That's what we're all seeking. And it doesn't yeah. come from doing. It comes from the pause. Man, that's awesome. And it, it takes a lot of, it's a soothing thought because it's like, all right, just take a freaking break, man. Like don't send another email, don't send another text. Just step back and kind of self-reflect on what you're doing and what, where you want to go. And it's just, uh, yeah. it's just, it just reduces some stress to just even hear that because it's like sometimes we get so wrapped up in the thing we're doing. Just take a step back yeah. and, and kind of detach and see what's going on. Um, yeah. Well, the last, last question is, and something I ask everybody, and it may be really obvious to the listeners of this podcast, but if you had to reflect back on, on your life and you know, describe how wrestling shaped and, and changed your life, you know, what would you say? Oh man, it taught me so many lessons and the older you get, the more lessons you kind of draw from it really. And the work that I do in terms of like coaching is like, I really reflect on that a lot. So I do a lot of reflection, right? A lot of coaching mm -hmm. is, is really just helping people reflect and be reflecting and all these amazing conversations I have on the podcast, et cetera, et cetera. So um, if I could boil it down to one thing, certainly, you know, I'd like the productive pause is that value of that, the hitting the pause button, right? Cause at the beginning of the season, you, you know, if you could look at the one hour that you spent all season long, that was most important. It was the one hour that I sat down with the coach setting goals, right? That sort of dictated all the other work, right? So it's like that. Um, but I'll, I'll say one thing wrestling uh, taught me and one thing wrestling gave me. Number one, one thing wrestling uh, taught me was just hard work, man. I can work. I can outwork anyone. Um, I can, I can, you know, work when I'm uncomfortable. I can work when I'm tired. Uh, and I can, I, I know that I have this, this ability to just put myself through pain and suffering to, to achieve something meaningful. Uh, that's number mm -hmm. one. I'd say what wrestling, wrestling gave me is maybe even more important is, uh, it is more important. It's, um, it's just unbreakable bonds of true brotherhood and friendship, right? You just think of, you know, Brendan Buckley, just his name comes up on the podcast here, you know, um, just yeah. a guy like that who's my coach and just these mentors and coaches and teammates who I've just gone through pain and suffering with, you know, and shared experience. And it's just, um, man, friends for life, bro not even friend, brothers, family members, you know, they are family. And I'm just so thankful for, for all of those people. And, um, even probably some of them are listening to this podcast right now. And it's like these brotherhoods of, you know, I just talked to a guy a couple of days ago who I haven't talked to for 20 years. And it's like, man, it's just so cool to reconnect. So, um, yeah, well, that's especially what, that's when you go through those, those freaking grueling workouts and the sweat and like the, the weight cutting and the locking with each other. Like you sh there's a lot of vulnerability there that you don't get with yeah. everyday life. Um, last yeah. thing is where can, uh, where can people find uh, your Ted talk? And you know, if they want to, I know we talked about it a little bit earlier, but again, if, if they want to 
reach out to you and maybe have you work with them. You do something called a clarity call and just maybe sign off like yeah. that. Then we'll wrap this up. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you. I appreciate you, Ryan, Ryan uh, allowing me to do that. But yeah, my website, Jim Harshaw, J-R for junior, Jim, H-A-R-S-H-A-W, Jim Harshaw, junior.com. Um, if you want to jump on a call, just you can click on the link on the website or just Jim Harshaw, junior.com slash apply, A-P-P-L-Y, just for applying for a call with me. And then, um, uh, yeah, and you can find me on all the social media outlets. And, um, but yeah, I, I love serving people. So if, if, if we can connect, if I can chat with anybody on the podcast or who's listening to the podcast here, um, it's really, uh, it's what I'm, I'm, I'm built to do and I love to do. That's the end of this episode, but definitely not the end of the show. For more episodes, please go to wrestlingchangemylife.org. Subscribe to us on iTunes. Give us a star rating. Show the love, baby. Show the love. Thank you so much. We'll see you again soon. Peace.